So yeah, I got a couple affiliations. It's just three. Um, I'm a research scientist at OpenAI, where I do AI research. I'm a professor at Berkeley, where I do AI research and teach AI and do some administration, um, but not while I'm on leave right now. And then I'm also one of the co-founders of Gradescope. If you ever need to do any grading, this can save you a lot of time. We got tired of spending a lot of time on grading homework and exams and build a tool for it. Now we've got a lot of data of people having graded. Now we build AI to learn from that data to grade automatically, and you can get close to zero time spent on grading in the near future. <laughs> okay, reinforcement learning. Let's see. All right, so Joel already introduced this formalism earlier today. Um, in reinforcement learning, we have an agent, and we want somehow to discover the right software for this agent. And this software will take actions. Um, as a consequence of the action, the environment and maybe the robot or something else will change state. A reward will be emitted that indicates how good or bad the resulting situation is. And then the agent is faced with the consequences of the action and has to act in this new situation and this repeats. And that's fundamentally what makes it different from, let's say, supervised learning where you have a one-off thing, you make a decision, and then things reset and you get a new one-off thing and it repeats. Here, what you see next depends on what you did before. The the topic within reinforcement learning that we're going to cover in this lecture is policy optimization. In policy optimization, the goal is to directly find a policy pi theta that, given a current state, emits a distribution over possible actions. And then samples from that distribution, and hopefully that distribution is a good distribution uh, that leads to good performance. Underneath, in everything I'll cover here, we can pretty much assume that it's going to be a deep neural net representing the policy. But in principle, it could be any other function that's parameterized with some vector theta. And as you change the entries in theta, you'll change the policy, the process that goes from current state to action being taken. So formally, what it looks like then, what we're trying to solve is we're trying to solve an optimization problem where we maximize expected sum of rewards accumulated over time. Expected because, well, the environment might be stochastic, so it might not be deterministic what we encounter. And second, often the policy will be stochastic. Um, it is the case that the optimal policy in MDPs tends to be uh, deterministic. But for learning, it can be convenient to consider a broader class of policies that is also considered stochastic policies because that actually tends to smooth out the optimization surface. So we'll be optimizing over stochastic policies and try to find one that performs well on expectation. Even though it converges, maybe it'll end up being deterministic. To make this a, a little specific, uh, for robotics, for example, the reward could be uh, the quality of a meal that a robot prepares. So a robot's busy cooking in a kitchen. After half an hour, a robot comes out, gives you a meal. There's been zero reward all the way throughout. But then when the meal comes out, you eat it. You say how good it is, maybe rate it from one to five stars and the robot will get a reward from one through five. As you can see how that this can be a really hard problem because the robot's been busy for half an hour and only gets one piece of feedback at the end of the whole session about how good the cooking was. And so to actually learn from that is really difficult and might have to do this again. Maybe it gets a different rating. I can tease apart what was different between the different sessions and from that somehow understand what it should do more of, what it should do less of. And that's exactly what policy optimization will try to do. Now, policy optimization is not the only way to tackle the problem. There's other methods, too. Um, the other methods are important, too. We're focused on policy optimization here. Uh, so let me give you a little picture of why policy optimization might be the method of choice in your practical situations. Um, often, the policy is simpler to represent than the Q function or the value function. Imagine a robot wanting to grasp an object. If you try to find the policy, what you're trying to find is a path for the gripper to go around the object and close. If you're trying to find a value function, you're trying to learn to predict exactly how much expected reward you have as a function of the state that you're in. And that's a much harder problem to precisely solve. And so it might be that just learning the policy is simpler than learning the value function. If you learn the value function, you actually don't yet know how to take actions. Once you have a value function to then decide how to act, you need to have a dynamics model that allows you to look ahead, do one step look ahead, say, OK, I have my value function. For all the actions I have currently available to me, what would happen if I take that action? Then what reward do I get for the transition? And what's the value at the next state? And so you need to actually learn two things to be able to act. You can resolve this by learning a Q function instead. That's even more complicated than learning a value function in many ways, because now you need to learn a function that understands how much reward you're going to get as a function of current state and action, which can be a pretty 
complicated function to learn, even for simple tasks where often the policy can be uh, much easier to represent. Here are some success stories uh, of policy optimization that might help motivate why you want to do it. The top row are successes from a little while ago, and they don't use any deep learning underneath. They are simpler policies underneath, but still parameterized policies where the policy optimization reinforcement algorithm allowed to fine-tune parameters in a way that humans couldn't fine-tune them by hand, and as a consequence could get better performance than uh, hand-tuning of these systems. So what you see at the top is um, from UT Austin, the uh, robot dogs that play RoboCup soccer used reinforcement learning to learn to walk or run faster than the other robots that they're playing against, and hence be able to outcompete them in soccer. Then next one we'll see in a little more detail later is inverted helicopter flight uh, by Andrew Ings Group at Stanford. I was part of that team. Then next one is two-legged locomotion. Russ Tedrick's PhD thesis at MIT. Um, this is a biped walker, learn to walk from scratch with reinforcement learning in the real world. And then the last one is one that we'll also see a little bit about later. It's a task where you have a cup and a little string and then a ball attached to the end of the string. You're supposed to swing up the ball and catch it in the cup. The bottom row are some more recent success stories where there are deep neural nets underneath what's being learned. The policy is a network that will map for most of them, uh, not all of them though, from uh, raw pixels to raw motor commands. On the left, you see some uh, Atari games, as well as Labyrinth, which is a 3D uh, navigation environment that you navigate with these solutions from first-person vision. Um, then control of uh, two-dimensional robots in Majoko, control of three-dimensional robots in Majoko, control of actual robots, and then AlphaGo has a few stars here because there's a lot of pieces to AlphaGo and only one piece of it is uh, policy optimization, but it is also in there as part of um, how you restrict the branching factor. So your policy can help you reduce the number of things to consider as you search in the game tree uh, through p plausible futures that you might encounter. In terms of the overall landscape of reinforcement learning, um, policy optimization on the left here, dynamic program on the right, dynamic program you'll see a lot more of uh, later today. I'm sure Rich Sutton in the next session will cover a lot of dynamic programming. Um, Dynamic programming relies on a self-consistency equation that the value at the current time is equal to reward you get in the first transition plus value at the next time. Policy optimization directly optimizes the objective that you care about, which is expect expected reward. And of course, then with actor critic methods, you kind of get in the middle between the two. And this session, we'll cover these three. So we'll cover derivative-free optimization, we'll cover policy gradients, and then we'll see how we can use value functions inside policy gradients so that we get actor critic methods, which gets us pretty close to the value function methods. It's not that the other ones aren't important, there's just only so much we can cover in one lecture. In terms of um, outline for this lecture, we'll look at model-based methods first. It's often not what people think of when they say uh, policy optimization methods, methods and policy gradient methods, but we'll see them first. And Admittedly, people have had a hard time getting these to work as well as the other ones, but there's also a strong belief that model-based methods in the long run could be more sample efficient. And in a session like this, it's good to know what's out there rather than just the things that have worked the best of all things. And then we'll look at model-free methods. And at the end, we'll do something that kind of brings them both together uh, through the stochastic computation graphs framework. Okay, starting with uh, model-based. Um, what you see here is also a split into three types of derivatives that we'll study. We'll study path derivatives, we'll study derivative-free methods, and then we'll study um, likelihood ratio uh, gradients. Three different ways of computing the derivative. If you have a derivative, you know in which direction to step to improve your uh, policy. Different sets of assumptions. We'll start out with some pretty strong assumptions here. We'll assume that f is F is a dynamics model that describes next state given current state in action. For now, we'll assume it's known, differentiable. We'll assume the reward function is known, differentiable. And we'll assume that the policy is known. But that's not really an assumption because we're designing the policy ourselves. We always know the policy. Um, and then also assume that it's a differentiable policy. OK, so let's assume we have an MDP with only two transitions that happen. So a very short horizon, just for making it concrete and fitting it on a slide. 
top row, what do we have? State at time zero, dynamics model, and action we take as prescribed by the policy, potentially stochastic policy, then results in um, next state, then policy decides what to do, next state at time two. And then we might have another uh, transition and this would continue, but we could also stop at two time steps. And then we have rewards at the bottom that decide how much we got, how good this current trajectory was. What we try to optimize is the sum of all rewards. The first one here doesn't matter too much um, because we can't really influence it because we start in whatever state we start in, but I'm just showing it for symmetry of the, of the figure. So the notation, reward function R maps from state to reward, policy pi theta maps from state to action, for now let's assume deterministic, and then the dynamics model maps from state and action to the next state. Then what we'd like to do is optimize expected sum of rewards. So we'll call u of theta the utility of a current policy uh, pi theta. And so we're trying to maximize u of theta. So in this case, what that means is maximizing a sum of R0, R1, R2. Now, we can actually compute a gradient estimate along this graph. Think of this, I mean, a lot of you have seen a whole week of deep neural nets last week. Um, think of the thing on the left as just a neural net that has, has a kind of special structure. It's a neural net with three layers, with some connections within the layer, um, but it's very much like a neural net. And so in principle, you could run uh, backpropagation through this to find the derivative of utility, which is a sum of the bottom things, which would be, sum of the bottom things would be a loss function. I want to make it as high as possible. In this case, you can just take derivatives through this. So you'd say, well, I care about derivative of utility with respect to all the parameter, parameters theta, which are the weights on the policy connection. Um, then what is this? It has derivatives of reward with respect, each of the rewards with respect to state. Um, and then derivative of state with respect to the policy parameters. Um, we can expand the last one this way. The state depends on the policy parameters through how you ended up in that state, which is dependent on what state you were in at the previous time, which also depends on the policy parameters, and depends on uh, the dynamics model uh, directly. Oh, this should be a U here. The dynamics model directly depending on the controls you, action you took, and then how the control action depends on the parameter vector theta, or in this case, just entry theta i. And then um, the derivative of the control action with respect to the parameter vector theta depends on the policy, but then also depends on what state you were in. And just so there's another uh, recursion here with respect to state, and then state with respect to the policy parameters. That's just backpropagation spelled out in a recursive way. And so you could either do that by hand, or you could just feed this computation graph that you see at the top left, feed into an automatic differentiation package, where you feed in f, you feed in r, you feed in a parameterized policy pi theta, which is the variables that you're trying to optimize over, and then just ask it for a derivative, and you're good to go. So to get derivatives, policy gradients, we just do a rollout, which is executing the policy, then do a backprop, which gives us a gradient, and maybe we do multiple rollouts on multiple initial states to get a, a lower uh, variance on our gradient, and we can do updates. So that gives us the simplest version of a policy gradient algorithm for deterministic dynamics, deterministic policy. Let's take it a step further. What if we have a stochastic dynamics model? So next state is function of current state in action plus some noise. Um, actually, you can simply consider these noise variables constant once the rollout has happened. So once the rollout has happened, you just freeze the noise and you're back to a deterministic model because the noise is frozen, there's nothing stochastic about it anymore. And you can still apply backpropagation just like you could do before. Of course, you gotta realize that you might have to do multiple rollouts to see multiple instantiations of these noise variables and then compute multiple gradients and average those gradients to get a lower variance estimate. But mathematically speaking, you can just do one rollout and get an uh, estimate of the gradient uh, in exactly the same way. So more generally, if you had a stochastic dynamics model, next state depends stochastically on current state in action. You can reparameterize this. 
by saying it's going to be a deterministic function that depends on current state and action as well as some noise variable wt. And the function encodes the stochasticity by depending on that noise variable. For example, in the case of a Gaussian distribution, um, maybe the next state is a Gaussian distribution as a function of g of st and ut. You can just split it out as we did on the previous slide, but it doesn't have to be a Gaussian. Anything where you have a continuous noise variable, uh, you can do this. And then what you have is a computation graph that looks like this. You have your rollout. As your rollout happens, your noise happens. You can determine what that noise is, put it in there, and then do a backpropagation to the graph in exactly the same way. The same is true when your policy becomes stochastic. You can, when you execute your policy, see what the noise variables are that you sampled, insert them into the graph, freeze them for your backpropagation, and same for the reward function, even though often the reward function is deterministic, if in some, some situations you have a stochastic re reward function, you can do the same thing. So at this point, we're able to deal with stochastic, reward, dynamics, and policy, and just use a backpropagation pass to get the gradient out. Of course, it still assumes that we know the dynamics model and we know the reward function. We just uh, have to fill in the noise to be able to do this. Let's look at a full algorithm. So we know how to compute gradients. What we can now get is a complete policy gradient algorithm. Um, we can iterate, going from one to two over our iterations. Then we do multiple rollouts in each iteration. Doing a rollout means sampling an initial state, then sampling all the noise that we'll experience, noise in the dynamics, noise in the policy execution, and noise in the reward function. If anything's deterministic, you just can skip the noise sampling for that. Based on that, you can do your forward pass. Then you can do your backward pass, average all the gradient estimates, and take a step in the gradient direction or do something fancier that's a higher order to optimize this. If you have a real world system, you might not have access to the noise yourself. The real world will sample the noise for you, at least for the dynamics and possibly for the reward function. Then you just back solve for it. As you have had an experience, you say, well, st plus 1 should be equal to f of st comma ut plus some noise. I've seen st plus 1, st, and ut. I can back solve for the noise, and that just the environment provides it, and you solve for it. Yes? Um, one reason to average it is to get a lower variance estimate. An alternative would be to take one gradient estimate, take a step, and repeat. Either way can work. Um, that's kind of up to you how you want to implement this. Um, if you don't average it, you might have to take smaller steps. It might still be advantageous. Um, it could be that you average it because it's easier to simulate many things in parallel at the same rate as you could simulate one thing. And then you'd rather average it rather than doing one at a time. But both can work. Yes? So Good question. So is this for continuous states and actions? Um, for the differentiability assumption to be true, we need continuous states and actions. Otherwise, you won't be able to differentiate through these functions. And we'll later see what to do when we don't have that assumption. But for now, that's what we're, what we're assuming. Correct. Yes? Um, I, I don't think anybody has a real answer for that yet, in that it's, it's still a little bit of a challenge to get model-based RL to work well when you, typic well, so typically, this is coming next on the slide here, typically you would not have a known dynamics model F, and you would have to estimate it from the data that you're collecting. So you'd have an unknown dynamics model F, which you're, which you're learning, as well as learning the policy at the same time. And there's a lot being learned at the same time, and people still have a hard time getting this all to work reliably. And when you're trying to get something to work, it's often easier to work with larger batches, because you know if you take an infinitely large batch, you, you know what the behavior is going to be. Whereas if you take very small batches or only one rollout, 
it's harder to understand the behavior and harder to have invariants that you know are guaranteed to be true. Um, but I do think in the long run, people will figure out ways that you go just one rollout at a time, update, and go again. In fact, I suspect people will do things, and people have tried some things like that, where you actually, during the rollout, you would update your dynamics model F as you're rolling out, re-optimize re your policy during the rollout based on the latest update of F, and adjust your policy during a single rollout even to be even more sample efficient. Other questions? So the full model based algorithm then would be you do what's shown on the slide as well as in every iteration you estimate the dynamics model F from the data. As I said, it's been hard to get these things to work, but there have been a few successes. For example, the uh, SVG uh, algorithms from Nicholas Hayes and collaborators at uh, DeepMind have shown quite some success with this model-based RL approach. So let's expand this to a full horizon here. So we have the full computation graph. I dropped the noise parameters, the noise in the dynamics, noise in the policy, noise in the reward function, just to keep it a little more self-contained. So we'll play around with this quite a bit. Um, but this is the computation graph that we'll be considering. We'll, and what happens is that we'll compute a gradient starting from every time step t. So we won't just do one gradient pass starting from time zero, but we'll say from every time step, what is the gradient that we can compute relative to the policy parameters at that time based on the entire future? Okay, so we'll have many copies of this, one for each time step t. SVG infinity does what I just described. You lay out the computation graph, from each time step, and then do the backprop based on what I just said, back solving for the noise, backprop through it, and get a gradient, and do it for each time, then add it together from all times, and that's your uh, gradient estimate. Now, you can have other variants of this. The issue with this SVG infinity is that it can be high variance. If the horizon is long, there can be a lot of stochasticity in the process, and the estimate that you get could be a high variance estimate. And there are ways to reduce the variance. One way to do this is introducing discounting. So you could have discounted rewards for the future rather than actual rewards. That's a pretty natural thing to do. You can do more. You can just shorten the horizon. You can say, I'm only going to look k steps ahead. And then to account for what happens after k steps ahead, you introduce a value function. We haven't covered in this lecture how you're going to estimate that value function. But let's assume you can estimate a value function. You can have a value function that is at the very last node. So over here, instead of r, we have v, v phi, phi because we are parameterizing the value function and we're going to have to estimate these parameters phi. And then once you put your value function here, you can do the exact same thing as if it was a reward. We're still optimizing some of all of these, maybe discounted some of all of these. That's our computation graph, back propagation, and we get a policy gradient out. And we do it again for all time steps t. In the more extreme scenario, um, SVG1, we stop after one time step. So you're going to look one time step ahead, cap it off with a value function there, back through this small computation graph, but do it for all time slices t, add it all together, get your policy gradient. Even more extreme, you could not even have the dynamics model in this anymore. You could just say, I have a current state, current action results in a Q value. That's your computation graph, backpropagate to that, which is very short backpropagation and you get a gradient of your policy this way. Now you estimate a Q function, Q phi, that's uh, SVG0 or DDPG, depending on the exact details of how you collect data and represent some things. In the last one, you actually don't need to learn a dynamics model anymore. So some advantage there that you don't need to learn a dynamics model, of course, by learning it, maybe you internalize something about the environment that's useful and you can learn more efficiently, but if you have trouble learning a dynamics model, don't want to do it, SVG0 avoids you having to learn a dynamics model. Let's make this concrete. So you can do this for all the versions that I showed on the previous slide. Simon. Yeah, we just said, what does DDPG stand for? Okay, good question. What does it stand for? DDPG stands for Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient. And SVG, I'm actually spacing out on what it stands for. Um, stochastic, value stochastic value gradient? Okay, thank you. 
So SVG is stochastic value gradient. So let's make this into a full algorithm. I picked SVG1 as a, uh, SVG0 as a, is it SVG0? Yeah, I picked SVG0 as a concrete example. Um, but you can do the same thing for the other ones. Actually, I skipped one then. Let's go back to SVG1. I picked SVG1 as the first concrete example. SVG1, this is the computation graph. This is what's associated with that. And then on the right, we see the full algorithm. We do rollouts. For each rollout, what happens is a forward pass. We collect the data from that forward pass. We store any noise encountered during the forward pass, either by back solving, if it's in the real world, for what the noise was, or by just knowing what the noise is because we're simulating and sending the noise ourselves. Then we have three things to do, and it, you can choose when you do each one of them. There's a bit of choice there, but you have to learn three things. You have to learn a policy, a value function, and a dynamics model. And so maybe uh, you first do a policy update, but you don't have to. A natural thing could be to first do a dynamics model update, only then solve for the noise, then do a, a policy update, then do a value update. Um, the policy update is, requires the noise in the dynamics, and then the back propagation pass, which in this case is the equation shown over here. That gives you your gradient estimate for the policy. Your value function gradient estimate could be something as simple as you have a parameters value function, which with least squares you fit to a estimated value, which is estimated based on one step look ahead, reward your experience plus gamma times value at the next state based on the value function you currently have. Typically, <clears throat> this is considered a constant once you ha get it out of there, and only this phi is differentiated through when uh, taking the gradient here, and this is considered a constant computed based on what is the previous iterations phi. And then we need a gradient for the dynamics model and can update the dynamics model. So that's a full algorithm that you can implement and uh, run policy gradients with. Question? Yes? Uh, can you go back? Uh, yeah. Is it actually necessary to solve for WT there? Because then the, the bullet point below that, you're just going to use on F of SU and W, which I guess would be the just ST plus one. So. Yes, good point. So let me clarify this. So what happens here, when I say f of st, u, t, w, t, f is a function that we have available because we're learning it. This function f will depend both on s, u, and w. And you want to make sure to evaluate your f at the noise that you experienced in the real world or in your rollout. You don't want to assume zero noise here. You could, but it would not be as precise a gradient um, as you average over multiple rollouts than if you use the actual noise that you experienced. So this thing here is actually differentiated through. So do we actually have two uh, dynamics models? Because there's one on the line above that is just a function of S and U, and then there's this one that's just Oh, <laughs> yeah. So notation-wise, what, yeah. OK, so for this dynamics model here, the way this would be written is you would have F, S, T, U, T plus W, T. There would just be a plus W, T living here. Mm -hmm. If you had a more complicated dynamics model where the noise comes in a more complicated way, then you'd have to solve um, in a different way for W, T and then insert it in here. Correct, yeah. So think of this as just a plus W, T, and you do want to keep the plus W, T. You don't want to lose it. OK, but, but so either way, this, this, uh, on the second line here, it's just going to evaluate to S, T plus 1. So we don't, I don't see W, T being used anywhere else. Oh. The reason it will not evaluate to ST plus 1 is because we're actually substituting this thing over here, the policy uh, pi, pi theta. will go into here for UT. And so we're actually differentiating through this whole thing. And okay, so it has the same value, but it doesn't have the same expression. Same value, but not, same, not the same gradient necessarily. Right. It depends on how WT plays into it. If it plays into it the simplest way, I believe it actually will have the same gradient. Yep. If a more complicated uh, dependence on WT, it's not guaranteed that the gradient is the same. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. SVG0, we don't need to learn a dynamics model because the computation graph doesn't have the dynamics model in it. We just have a Q function there. So we have a backprop 
to compute the gradient of the policy and then a Q function update, which could be just like with the value function we had before, just some kind of squared error minimization where this estimate here is usually frozen to be whatever the previous parameter vector predicted for it to be, fixed here, derivative here, only with respect to the first uh, phi appearance in the first term. Okay, so we have a few policy gradient algorithms that we've seen, or a whole family of them. Um, this has actually been used to solve some pretty interesting tasks, two-dimensional uh, robotic control in Mujoko. Um, the different versions seem to learn about equally fast. Um, if you want to turn this into uh, deterministic policy gradients and for it to work well, um, you need to do something a little extra. If you naively train SVG0, you end up very quickly with a deterministic policy that optimizes the Q values, because you, when you look at the policy update equation, it tries to find the action that maximizes Q, and that'll naturally make it deterministic. So you need to do something to keep it stochastic. Um, so add noise to the policy explicitly, force your policy to be stochastic when you collect data. Um, then your Q values learned are learned off policy, but that's fine with Q values. You can learn them off policy if you do TD0. So with TD0, you can learn your Q values off policy and have a stochastic policy to collect the data. Then you, to get this to work stably with a deep neural net, uh, you need to play a few extra tricks, which were uh, proposed in the DDPG paper by Tim Lillicrap and collaborators. Um, for learning the Q function, you just don't, don't just take the last rollouts, you actually keep around the replay buffer, against the replay buffer, um, do updates on your Q function, then when you do this, when you compute your target Q values as reward plus next Q value under the current policy, um, these primes here, phi prime and theta prime, what they mean is that they're not the current setting of your policy parameters and Q function parameters, Instead, they're the polyarch averaged, which is exponentially averaged past weights um, that you've encountered during learning so far. And so these average parameters evolve much more slowly than the parameters of your current policy and current Q function, and will stabilize your target values, which allow your algorithm to be more stable and hopefully uh, converge. And this actually has then been applied to some more complicated robotic simulation tasks, and including vision-based uh, control on uh, driving. Question. Does this average over past few functions have a, have a meaning, or does it, like, does it function correctly in itself? So I'm not an expert on the meaning of, of what is associated with it, but a crude meaning that I've heard people associate with it is uh, it's like a, keeping track of a posterior over possible uh, values that your neural net should take on and it's keeping track of the, some mode of a posterior based on everything you've seen in the past. In practice, what it means is that you can take larger step sizes, and more, so more aggressive step sizes, and at the same time still have a stable representation that you keep around that is the result of your learning. Because effectively, it kind of slow, the average version is slower moving than the thing that's actually moving ahead, but that way you can explore more, you can have more aggressive exploration, more aggressive uh, optimization in the landscape of, that you're working in while keeping around something that's quite stable. I have another question. Yes. In DDPG, do you know if they use the replay for the policy updates or just the value function updates? I believe just for the Q value updates, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Uh, okay, that's our first type of gradients. Uh, which you can use inside model-based uh, reinforcement learning, or if you do the SVG0 or DDPG version, even within model-free settings, um, but assuming a differentiable policy and or a dynamics model. If you have discrete actions, what I just described to you is actually not going to uh, work out. If you don't have the ability to learn a dynamics model, if you have a discrete state space, um, this is also not going to work out as described. Let's look at some other methods that are applicable there. Simplest way to compute Grange is just to do finite differences. Right? If you have an optimi optimization objective, utility, which depends on your policy parameter vector theta, just perturb the policy parameter vector theta, 
one coordinate at a time, positive perturbation, negative perturbation, see what the difference is, divide by two epsilon, and there you have your derivative estimate. Some trickiness there. Um, if your function is stochastic, so at any point along the x-axis, which is uh, we're here optimizing a function of x, um, if anywhere along the way when you ask for a y value, there's a distribution over y values, then you need to be careful because you might end up with samples that are somehow uh, inconsistent in some way. You sample here, you get this point, you sample here, you get this point, and now the derivative looks the exact opposite way than what you want. So you need to be a little careful about this. If you have control over the noise that's present, well, if you don't have control, you can just average over many samples. If you do have control, you can make sure that the noise present in the sampling is the same for the plus and the negative epsilon perturbation, and that way you can get out a reliable uh, derivative estimate. So fixing the random seed can help to get those derivatives. It can actually also help in general whenever you're doing uh, policy optimization this way, when the dynamics model is being executed, um, if you control the noise is consistent, that's the same as intuitively something like, oh, my helicopter is trying to fly in pretty windy conditions, um, but when I compare performance of two policies, I should compare those policies under the same windy conditions, not each time randomly sample windy conditions and see which one does better, because one might have just been luckier with the wind conditions than the other one. With this kind of approach, just finite perturbations, uh, finite difference derivatives, Actually, the helicopter project at Stanford was able to learn to control this helicopter here. So you see here is a helicopter being stably controlled. It's actually a very hard control problem. And in fact, being stably controlled to fly inverted. Um, now, what happened here is that to make this work, a policy class was handcrafted with careful consideration of how the four controls that you have for a helicopter depend on the state resulting in only 12 parameters that need to be optimized over. And we have only a very small number of parameters. Actually, these simple methods can be made to work, and very successfully so. To do this kind of derivative-free method, if you want to optimize over policy with 100,000 parameters, it might be a lot harder, might take a lot longer. But if you do have a lot of prior knowledge, then these simple methods can actually work quite well. Now, there are other gradient-free methods beyond just finite difference perturbation. Um, something called cross-entropy method, the covariance matrix adaptation, and variance thereof. So let's take a look at those. Cross-entropy method is still optimizing the same objective. We'll view you, the utility, as a black box. So in everything we've seen in the first half of the lecture, we've taken derivatives through the dynamics and so forth, understood that there was a temporal process happening. Here we're going to ignore that there's a temporal process, just say we have a policy, see what happens, just like in the finite differences. So that means we're probably not going to be optimal in terms of sample efficiency, but we do have something very simple uh, to work with. And so cross-entry is an example of an evolutionary method, and what characterizes those methods is that you keep around the population of whatever you're optimizing over, in this case, a population of policies. So we don't have just one parameter vector theta, we have a distribution over parameter vectors theta. For example, a Gaussian distribution with a mean mu, and maybe a fixed covariance or maybe a learned covariance. In this case, let's assume a fixed uh, covariance, so we don't have to explicitly talk about it. And we have a mean mu i, which says that for our current population, our current population of policies, mu i is the mean. And if I want the policy in that population, I sample from a Gaussian with that mean, and that gives me a parameter vector theta. CM then iterates, samples population members, which is samples policies from that Gaussian distribution over policies. Once it's sampled a policy, it executes rollouts under that policy. It stores what parameter vector it sampled as well as the utility it achieved under that policy. Once it's collected those, it now checks some subset of the policies that it sampled, let's say the top 10%, and then computes a new mean for the Gaussian, which maximizes the log probability of the policies sampled that were in the top 10%. So you're shifting your Gaussian mean to where the top 10% was, and then repeat again and again and again. Very simple procedure. Um, can actually work embarrassingly well. So for example, for the game of Tetris, which for a long time was a benchmark in reinforced learning that was used quite a bit, um, the numbers were such that cross-entropy was actually outperforming 
other reinforcement learning methods by quite a bit for a long time, and it took till um, a NIPS 2013 paper um, for a dynamic programming method to finally perform as well as a uh, cross entry method in the game of Tetris. Even though dynamic programming methods use a lot more information about the process than this cross, cross entry method. There's a whole family of these. So I'm collecting these on the slide. The intent is not for understanding each one of these just right now when we, I showed them to you, but later when you look back at the slides, you can see the relation, close relationship. Um, reward weighted regression says instead of taking the top, let's say 10%, for each policy that was sampled, we take some function of the utility achieved and the probability of sampling that particular policy, put that in front of the log probability and maximize this. Cross entropy would be a special case where you make that function one when you're in the top 10%, zero when you're not in the top 10%. But there are other functions you can take prescribed by this paper over here. Um, path integral method replaces the top 10% one zero scoring by exponential weighting of the utility you achieve. So it's a soft version of cross entropy where the best ones get weighted more. And then if you're not as good, you get weighted less in the uh, finding of the new mean. You can also find the covariance, not just the mean of that Gaussian. Then you get a CMA method. So, and then you can also do play some tricks with how you weight each one of them as a function of their utility. And then in the power method, there is actually some additional EM-like ideas and important sampling ideas that extract a little bit of second order information in the update, which might make it uh, more efficient. So all of these effectively look at maximizing log probability of parameter vectors of policy that you sampled before based on how well these parameter vectors ended up performing in their rollouts. Some example success stories, often used in graphics for animation of uh, humanoid-like characters. What you see here on the right is learning to control for the ball in a cup game. It started with a demonstration. A policy was learned to match the demonstration. That was not a good policy. We're seeing that policy being executed initially. Then the power method, which is a cross entropy method, is being run to optimize the policy. And in just about 100 iterations, it's able to learn to swing up the ball, catch it in the cup. This particular case, it's working based on a mo motion capture system that tracks the location of the ball. So it's working in state space. It knows the location of the ball, knows the state of the robot, and then based on the state information, provides feedback control to swing up and catch the ball. The main caveat, uh, the main advantage of this method is it's super simple, always nice to, introduce, uh, to do as your first test when you try something in reinforcement learning, just run cross entropy like method or just cross entropy itself, see how it works, gives you a measure of how feasible it might be to solve the problem. Not super sample efficient, that's the main caveat, um, especially when you have a high dimensional space that you're optimizing over, it could be sample inefficient, um, but the flip side of all of that is that maybe these days you don't care as much about sample efficiency if you're working in simulation. If you can parallelize over enough machines, this method is extremely easy to parallelize and scales extremely well with, paral uh, with parallelization. What you see here is a graph showing as a function of the number of cores, the median time to solve, uh, in this case, I believe it's a 3D humanoid problem. What you see here is a linear curve, which means that as you introduce more cores, it literally speeds up the method by a factor of how many more cores you introduced. Into the double number of cores, you go twice as fast finding a solution. And so that's really nice. So actually, you want to find a solution as quickly as possible. Even though these methods are not the most sample efficient, they might actually be the fastest if you have a large compute budget. Yes? Yeah, um, so were you only looking at the results of the last iteration when you're trying to take the top 10%? Or do you look at all of the history? If it's only the last iteration, why? OK, so in these methods, it's actually extremely simple what happens. You, you have your current distribution over policies. You sample from that. You execute each one of them. Might be one episode for each one of them. Might be a few episodes if you're in a very stochastic environment to get a better measure of how good they are. And then you just look, you, you don't do any optimization on those executions. You just execute them as is. So there is no, the first execution is not any different from, from the last one at that point. Um, what I'm asking 
like, because uh, you're going to be iterating this, right? Yes. Like, do you look at the whole history and every okay. single set of steps mm -hmm. that you've evaluated or just from the last iteration? The typical simple implementation just looks at the ones from the last iteration. Now, if in the last iteration you ended up being somehow confused because something weird happened and you found a spot where things looked good and you're concentrated all there and things all of a sudden are pretty bad, then you want to exactly think about what you're thinking about this. Well, should I really reset from scratch or should I actually go back to previous iterations, see where things were pretty good and restart from there? I think there's a lot of interesting questions about how to, what you might want to keep around from past iterations. I haven't seen anything, people might have done it, where to keep around more. You do a lot of rollouts here, so you, you're probably not going to want to keep around everything, um, but it might be that there's a scheme where you keep around most salient past executions to then more effectively update in the future. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, you're right. So the assumption in what I described is that the posterior you keep around is a Gaussian over parameter vectors. Um, it's a very simple assumption. It's not necessarily the right fit for most situations. It's quite effective and simple to, to go with. Um, it would be interesting to try other distributions that might better fit what your posterior looks like and resample from those. Simple thing could be, let's say, a mixture of Gaussians, which is also very simple to compute and to sample from and investigate how that does, uh, maybe even more complicated distributions. Uh, the results I've shown to you are all just keeping a, a simple Gaussian distribution around, though. Yeah, if you, if you use the, one of the latest methods in inference uh, for keep it, representing distributions, maybe you use a traditional autoencoder to represent your distribution, or maybe you use um, one of the uh, other aggressive models to represent the distribution. There's a trade-off because there would be some com compute involved in keeping that distribution around, and if you're doing everything in simulation, then ultimately compute is what you're constrained by. Um, if you're doing things in the real world, then maybe more complicated distributions, even if they require a lot of compute, are easier to justify because, well, you want to reduce real-world rollouts and you can do it by doing more compute. Yeah, it'd be very interesting to play around with. I don't know how well it would work, but there is probably a trade-off point there where being a little smarter about the distribution, while not expending too much compute, somehow will, somehow will achieve the best performance. Yes? How does this work with, the, with real world situations? Do you vary your environment constantly changes? Have there been experiments where you vary the environment, you know, n times uh, while you're running a cross entity method? So, if the environment, there's two ways the environment can change. One way it changes is that you get dropped in a new environment, but there's a distribution over environments, in which case you can think of that as uh, randomness, and, which, and so my, you might not have to do multiple rollouts per policy to get a good estimate of how good that policy parameter vector is. And so that would be a pretty good fit then. Another way the environment could change is that your environment changes during the rollout. So there is change over time. In that case, if you had a simple feed-forward neural net policy, let's say that you're parameterizing, then it would not be a good fit for your environment. And so if you want to apply this approach, um, you, and you want to do it the way I just described, you would have to pick a recurrent neural net. The recurrent neural net would then somehow store information about how the, because the environment would change and would somehow track how the environment is changing. And so then what you would learn is you would learn the weights of the recurrent neural net, but in its activations, it would be able to keep track of changes to the environment. And so then you would train a policy that is good at adapting to a changing environment, which is a, not what a lot, not a lot of people are testing on this, but it is in the real world, it is what it would be like. You need something that's good at adapting to a changing environment, not just a good policy for a stationary environment. But does it slow it down then? Because the big pro is it's fast, but if you do that, you end up at the same time. So that's a good question. Um, so. One reason it's fast is also because you don't have to do a backpropagation pass, okay? So that's nice because that means you don't have to store any information in your forward pass. And so if you had a recurrent neural net, 
policy. You would have to store a lot of information in your forward pass and then do a backward pass. And so for current neural nets, it would also be extra fast in some sense that you don't have to do a backward pass. Um, so there might still be benefits in that regard. Um, the parallelization, one thing I forgot to mention, the reason the parallelization works out so well is that all you need in terms of communication between uh, nodes is communicating the random seed of the perturbation. So even if you have a, let's say, million dimensional parameter vector, if I'm collecting the data from all the other workers, all I need to know is what random seed did they use and what was the average performance under the policy they had. Because if I know the average performance, which is a scalar, I know the random seed, which is a scalar, and I can locally reconstruct what their perturbation was, and I can do the cross entropy update locally. So communication is essentially, well, not zero, but it's extremely close to zero, and that's why you see the linear scaling, and that would st still be true if you had a recurrent neural net policy. You still would only need to know the random seed that was used for the perturbation at each of the worker nodes to understand what update to make locally. I think the, the real question, in some sense, what you're asking about is, what does it mean to be acting in an environment that continuously changes? And I think it's a question a lot of people are very interested in, but that we don't have really good um, benchmarks for. It makes it harder to, to work on. So you can, somehow you need a setting. You need settings where things are continually changing on you so you can test those ideas. And I think right now we don't have a good set of environments in which to test them, even though we know that for the real world, clearly it is what, what we need. Now we're going to look at, for the last one third, at what are the classical policy gradient methods. So we're going to see now is if somebody tells you policy gradients, and they don't say anything more, they'll likely refer to what we're going to cover now, even though we've already seen two types of policy gradient methods, namely the backpropagation ones, namely path derivatives, and we've seen the kind of cross-entropy evolutionary style uh, updates. Compared to the evolutionary strategies, we'll have the same set of assumptions, that is no assumptions on the dynamics model, no assumptions on the reward function. We just need to be able to execute things and know how much reward was collected. We can work with um, discrete state action spaces. But what we're going to want to do now is look at the details of what happens during the rollout to make the method more sample efficient than an evolutionary method. So we'll change notation a little bit temporarily to reduce clutter. And we'll introduce something called tau. Tau stands for an entire trajectory. Okay. So utility under policy pi theta is expected sum of rewards, and we'll write it as sum over all possible trajectories tau, probability of that trajectory tau under the current policy parameter vector theta times the reward accumulated along that trajectory tau. Same problem as we had before, just a change in notation to make it more compact. And so our goal is still to find the policy parameter vector theta that maximizes expected Sum of rewards now written this way. Two questions. Yes. Uh, is the trajectory the same as the rollout? Yeah, so trajectory, Thank rollout are the same thing. So tau stands for S0, U0, S1, U1, S2, U2, the entire sequence of states and actions. So what we'd like to do is compute a gradient of this utility u theta. Um, so nabla theta, sum of all trajectories of the quantity we just looked at. And to derive this, uh, we'll, we'll play some, some tricks that only in hindsight make sense. But it's a very short derivation. I think it's worth being aware of this trick and understanding how this is derived. So we bring in the gradient into the summation. That can pretty much always be done uh, when you have a summation. It can also be an integral. It can always, almost always be done, too. Then now we want to somehow compute that gradient. We know that the distribution depends on our parameter vector theta, but we're actually going to play a little trick first. We're going to multiply and divide by probability of trajectories under theta. Then we 
move the denominator off to the right. Then we use the identity that the derivative of the log of x is the same as dx over x. And so we replace this with gradient of log probability of trajectory under theta. So this thing here is just uh, applying derivative log in the opposite direction than it's usually used. At this point, we actually are in a very interesting situation. The reason this is interesting is because we have an expectation again. We see here is an expected value of under the distribution over trajectories of ground log probability of trajectory times reward. With an expectation, we can approximate it from samples. And so we can say, well, we're going to compute this gradient or approximate it by this quantity over here, which is the same thing as what we have over here, but approximated from samples. So that means that we can execute our policy, and for the rollouts, the trajectories that we obtain, we can average that quantity for each rollout to get a gradient estimate. Now, we still have to compute that quantity. I haven't told you how to compute the grad log probability of a trajectory. But if we know how to compute that, then we can do this uh, based on uh, sample estimate. You can derive this in a different way, too. So here, it's very much a hindsight type derivation where you wanted to end up with an expectation. So you multiply with the probability, divide by it, and then work the other thing in the back. So you end up with an expectation. So you can compute this from samples. Another way to derive it is to look at importance sampling. What is importance sampling? It's a tool to sample from a distribution. Well, to generate samples from a distribution that you can't sample from directly. So you want to sample from a distribution. Let's say you want to sample from a distribution um, under parameter vector theta. But all you can sample from is distribution under parameter vector theta old. And you want to still know what the expectation is under the new parameter vector theta. What you can do is you can sample from theta old and then reweight your samples by the ratio of probability under theta divided by probability under theta old. If you reweight your samples by this ratio, you get a good estimate of the expected value under the distribution under theta, even though you sampled under theta old. So what this tells you is that in principle, you could sample under your current policy, theta old, and evaluate how good another policy is with new parameter vector theta, and then maybe optimize this quantity to find a better parameter vector theta. You can actually do this, uh, but often it's not that great an estimate if you move far away. So actually the first order approximation of this might be the most meaningful thing to use. So let's see what the first order approximation looks like. If you first order approximate this important sampling estimate, um, work through it, this expectation over here, take the gradient to see what it is, then we evaluate it at the current theta, which is theta old. We get the same thing we had before, and so we get the same quantity as we had on the previous slide. So what we see here is that from importance sampling, seeing what the importance sample estimate looks like, what the derivative looks like in the importance sample estimate, we end up with the exact same uh, objective or exact same gradient as we had on the previous slide. So two ways of deriving the same thing. Very interesting. What we have here is a gradient estimate that works even if the reward function is discontinuous. So if your reward is a 0, 1 reward, you can still use this. Because we actually don't take a derivative of the reward function. Even though we're trying to optimize expected reward, we never take a derivative through it. And a lot of problems are more easily specified with a 0, 1 reward function, success, failure. And so for those problems, this can actually work, which is really nice. Intuitively, what's happening with these kind of gradient estimates is that what you're doing is you increase, if you take a step in the gradient direction, you increase the probability of paths that have high reward and decrease the probability of paths that have negative reward. Or if all the roads are always positive, you increase a lot the probability of paths that have high reward and increase a little bit the, path of, the probability of paths that have low reward. Now, you can't increase all probabilities, of course. It has to sum to 1. So there's a renormalization in happening. And so if all rewards are positive, well, it's still end up being that the ones that don't achieve as high reward ultimately will see their probability drop to be able to increase the probability of the ones with higher reward. So what's happening here, if you look at three rollouts, 
if you had three rollouts, this update would shift probability mass to the rollout that has better reward. It's very different from the path derivatives we saw before. With the path derivatives from the very first stretch, those derivatives will look at those trajectories and look at how should I change my parameter vector to locally perturb my trajectory to get a better trajectory and then essentially update the path for each of the rollouts rather than shifting probability mass from the not so good ones to the better ones. It's a very different way of optimizing. The beauty of this one is that you actually don't need derivatives through the reward function. In fact, we'll soon see you don't even need derivatives through the dynamics model to compute the grad log probability of path under parameter vector. Let's take a look at that. So what is this grad log probability of path under parameter vector? Well, the, the probability of a path is the probability of the initial state, which I left out here, then times probability of next state given current state in action, and probability of action given state multiplied over all times. This is the policy. We have access to that. This is the dynamics model. We might not have access to that, but look, there's no theta here, and that's going to help us a lot. So if you work this out, grad log of a product is grad of the sum of the logs, then since there's no theta in here, the grad with respect to theta just disappears, and we end up with just grad theta sum log probabilities of actions given state. And so what we see here is that we can compute the derivative without having access to a dynamics model. OK. So what we can do now is we can do rollouts. For each of the rollouts, we can compute the grad log probability of path under the parameter vector this way, multiply with reward along that path, and that gives the contribution of that path to the gradient. Spelling this out more fully, this is how we're going to estimate gradients. And this quantity over here, we're going to estimate this way. And on expectation, this gives us the right gradient. If you do infinitely many rollouts, this will be the correct gradient. If you do finally many, it will be an estimate of the gradient. As formulated so far, there are some issues. It's a very high, high variance estimate. So I do need a ton of rollouts, or you need to play some tricks to reduce the variance of this estimate. So we'll look at some tricks to do that, baseline, temporal structure, uh, exploitation, and then also look at what we need to do to make this stable uh, in terms of step sizing slash trust regions. Yes? Uh, where does those variance come from? Why is it high variance? Yep. Intuitively, the reason it's high variance is imagine all your rewards are positive, then every path will try to increase its own probability. When you roll, when you roll out and you have a path, this gradient says we should make this path more likely, even the not so good ones. So that's not great. That means that you have all these uh, contributions fighting each other, all trying to increase their probability instead of the bad ones understanding they're bad and trying to decrease their probability. But as long as we have the ranking of those paths. That's exactly what we're going to exploit. But in the current equation right now, that's not exploited. Thank you. So when the roads are always positive, we try to increase probabilities of all paths. That's not great. So what we really should do is introduce a notion of ranking or understanding whether you're better than average or not. That's called a baseline. So the gradient becomes this over here with subtracting a baseline from the reward along a path. Now, if you're better than average, if the baseline is the average you got along all executions, then you increase your probability. If you're worse than average, you decrease your probability. OK, there's some math you can do to show that this will still give you an unbiased estimate of the gradient. In fact, you can even do some math to find an optimal, that is, minimal variance estimate, which in practice people don't use that much, but it is what it is. You can, in principle, use it. Simpler thing to do is to just use the average of what you got among the rollouts that you did and just use that as your baseline. So another thing you can do is exploit temporal structure. Right now, what we have is this equation over here. The grad log probabilities have a lot of temporal structure, but the reward has temporal structure too. And what you can explain is the fact that future uh, past rewards don't depend on current actions, or otherwise phrased, current action only influences future rewards. But in the equation over here, current action probabilities, or grad log current action probabilities multiply with all rewards, past or future. 
we should get rid of the past. Um, and so then we get an estimate that looks like this, where you only multiply with everything that's in the future here, rather than also what's in the past. A good choice for B would then be expected future return. That's actually a value function. You can use a value function if you can estimate one, or you can just use an average of future returns from that time over your multiple rollouts. This gives us a full algorithm. So this is a vanilla policy gradient algorithm. You have some initial parameter vector theta, some initial baseline, maybe zero, what you think of as average performance. Then you iterate. You collect a set of trajectories by executing current policy. In each trajectory, you compute the returns from that time onwards. You compute what we call an advantage estimate, which is the reward you got from that time onwards minus what you get on average from that time or state onwards. That's the thing we have multiplied with the grad log probabilities. You might also refit this average estimate based on your current rollouts. And then you use this in your grad log probability action given state times advantage how much you're better than average to do an update to the policy. So this is a basic algorithm. If you draw enough samples, this will actually work pretty well. Now what remains, I want to give you a quick overview on extra things you can do to make this even more effective. First thing is that you need to worry about step sizing. Step sizing always matters because if you step too far, the grade is only a local approximation, step too far, you actually don't improve on your objective, you might do worse. In reinforcement learning, however, it's even a bigger issue than in other optimization problems. Because in reinforcement learning, if you take a step that's too big, the data you're going to collect under the new policy is going to be non-interesting data. It, it's not good data to compute grains from. Imagine that you have a policy where you sometimes get non-zero rewards, sometimes you don't, but you sometimes do get non-zero rewards, so you have some gradient signal. Take a step that's too big, you're back in the regime where you never get any reward, you get no signal. So you want to be extra careful in RL about your step sizes. In supervised learning, why, do, why is it not as big a concern? Well, if you step too far, the next update, the data is sitting there for you, waiting for you to tell you to go back in the other direction. Maybe it's a little less efficient, but the data will tell you what to do. In RL, you're too far, you have a terrible policy, you don't get good data, you don't get any signal, and now you actually don't get to optimize in a meaningful way. Simple step sizing would be just to do a line search. You have a great interaction. Along the great interaction, you try different step sizes, see how well the rollouts perform, and then just take the best one and call it done. It's a little naive, but it, because it ignores more information you can exploit from your rollouts. It turns out that just looks at first order information. But you can exploit a little more information to understand where your first order approximation is good, where it's bad, and then within a region of where it's good, find the best spot. <coughs> So we're going to define a trust region. It's a region where you trust your first order approximation. And then, once we have the trust region, we'll find the best point within the trust region, and we repeat. What would be a good trust region? We could say, well, we want to stay in a region that's close in terms of, in terms of policy parameter vector. We want the resulting distribution after we make a change over trajectories to be close to the original distribution. So we want to measure in terms of distribution over trajectories, not measure in terms of Euclidean distance in policy vector space. Now we need to measure this KL divergence. Um, turns out we can expand the probability of paths, compute those KL divergences. I'll go a little fast here, but you can look at the slides more slowly later. It turns out it simplifies, and that all that shows up ultimately is probabilities under your policy. The dynamics model cancels out again. So you can compute this trust region based on just having access to the policy. That's nice. So we have KL, KL based on the policy, which you can approximate by looking at along the rollouts at the states you visit. What is the KL divergence at those states between the policy that you used to have and the policy you have after your update? So with that, we have a constraint optimization problem. We want to keep the KL small enough to be in our trust region while optimizing the first order approximation of our objective. Um, we can second order approximate this KL um, to make this whole thing a little more efficient. Uh, what you get is the Fisher information metric shows up. And what you actually then get is something very similar to the natural gradient, except with a constraint 
rather than just a natural gradient step. Question somewhere? Yes. Sorry, say it again. So g hat here is the estimate of the gradient. So we compute an estimate of the gradient based on the likelihood ratio policy gradient. That's living there. And that's what that is. Yes? So that's the KL fraction here is of the current policy from the new one. Can you give some intuition for why it's that direction? So why do we measure the KL in the direction that we're measuring it? Um, it's the computationally easier one to measure is the main reason. Yes? Why would you use the divergence um, So why would you use the divergence rather than a distance metric? Um, the math works out really nicely. That, that, that way I would say is the main justification. I mean, the Kell diversion in general is seen as a pretty good measure of how far distributions are apart. But among the measures you can use for how far distributions are apart. This is the one where the math works out very cleanly and is easy to compute with. OK, so we have a constraint optimization problem, which can be solved quite easily, it turns out. Um, it is very similar to the natural policy gradient, um, but by having a Region rather than a step size, which is a natural policy gradient, would do. Um, you actually have a more stable algorithm. To find the actual update here, you can form the Lagrangian and do dual descent on the Lagrangian, uh, the Lagrange multiplier, to find Lagrange multiplier that achieves the right epsilon and find uh, the correct step that you want. Okay, are we done? Um, we need to do a little bit of extra work here. Um, turns out if Theta is high dimensional. Inverting that Fisher information matrix can be expensive and uh, not practical. So there are some tricks you can play to make this practical, which is uh, detailed in the uh, 2015 ICML paper by John Schulman and uh, collaborators uh, that can speed this up quite a bit. Another thing you can do to make this even more efficient is instead of using G hat here, you can replace this by something else. So instead of using the Actual policy gradient, the first order approximation, you can actually go back to the important sampling estimate that I showed to you that allowed us to derive this first order approximation. You can actually plug back in the important sampling estimate of the objective, a local estimate, which will also be valid within this trust region, if you make the trust region of the right size. And that way you can op optimize something much closer to the original objective than just using the first order approximation. If you look at the RL Lab TRPO implementation, that's what it does, as the optimization objective is the important sampling based estimate within the KL trust region. And we'll look a little more at this later. So here are some experiments that uh, we actually did with this. Um, what you're going to see here is the final gates obtained with trust region policy optimization, which what we just covered, um, in this case, for 2D uh, locomotion experiments in Mujoko. The reward function here is actually pretty simple. The reward function is just about forward progress and impact with the ground. So you don't need to encode anything about what walking looks like. Um, the way this works is that initially, this robot will just fall over. But over time, to, thanks to different random executions, it, figures out that some ways of falling over take longer to fall over than others and so are better, puts more weight on those trajectories, and then drifts towards finding a good gate that maximizes reward. Here are some comparison graphs with uh, related methods, um, but that don't have all the machinery that we just talked about, and actually tends to learn quite a bit quicker, even on the simple problems, but especially on the harder problems such as Hopper and Walker. You can apply the exact same method to Atari games, actually. You can use trust region policy optimization to find good policies on Atari. Um, the original results, of course, were with uh, Q-learning, DQN. And it turns out that typically DQN remains the more sample efficient method. But in terms of wall clock time and ease of use, often the policy optimization methods are easier. And the current state of the art is often achieved with something called A3C, which we'll cover in a few slides. And that might not be as sample efficient as DQN, but is wall clock time more efficient uh, than DQN. 
and very similar to what I just showed you. So let's take a look at that. In the last couple of minutes we have here, 10 minutes for connecting with actor critic, we can do even better than what I just described by bringing in value functions, okay? So our policy grade estimate has sum of future rewards minus a baseline. And the baseline, a natural baseline, would be the value function, if we have a value function, because that tells us from this state on average how well you're going to do. And then we can understand whether the random action you took was better or worse than average, and whether then you need to increase or decrease the probability of that action. So how do you estimate the value of a state under current policy? Well, there's the Bellman equation, which tells you how the value of a current state, S, is a function of you know, policy, probability of our actions given state, then probability of next state given current state in action, reward associated with the transition, plus gamma times the value at the next state. Self-consistent set of equations that you can solve for the value of the policy. And in fact, you can fill in your current estimate on the right-hand side, and then compute from that the left-hand side, and repeat until this converges. If you have a large state space, you can't really do it um, by enumerating over all states and repeating this, so you need to approximate things. Uh, you might have a big neural net that represents your value function with parameter vector phi zero initially. You collect your data. On your data, you set up the objective above here based on samples, and so you want to move you want to find a new value function, v phi, that is corresponding to the left-hand side here, and then it should match this thing over here, which is a sample estimate of the right-hand side. And then, of course, you don't want to move too far from your current estimate, otherwise you might be overfitting to the last set of samples. And so this way you get a new estimate of your value function, and then you might um, repeat this until you uh, have conversions, or you might just do one update and do a policy grant update again. So we can then fill that in over here, an estimate of the value function. What's nice about this is that we have generalization now across states that we're exploiting, rather than just a simple baseline that might just depend on average how much do you get. We have another estimate that's high variance, sum of rewards. When you do a rollout, again from the same state, likely different things will happen. So clearly this is going to be a noisy estimate. What it really is, is an estimate of the Q value. What you would like to have there is to know what the Q value is of that state in action, and then use that, compare with the value, and that tells you how much better the action was than other actions, or worse than other actions, and tells you how to update your policy. So, yes, it's a reasonable estimate to just take some of rewards. It's an unbiased estimate, but it's not a low variance estimate, and you might need a lot of samples for it to be good. It doesn't exploit any notion of generalization that we might be able to exploit from having seen other things. So we can, first thing we can do is reduce variance by discounting. Very easy thing to do. And then the next thing we can do is reduce variance by function approximation. So it might be that in reality we care about actual sum of rewards, but we use discounting nevertheless to reduce variance. Okay? So gamma here then becomes a hyperparameter that we optimize over that maybe initially is far away from one, maybe 0 0.5, something very small. So you don't look far ahead, you have low variance, but then as you do more learning, it might become higher, you're able to look further ahead. Inducing function approximation, what you can do as well, um, you can say, just like we saw very early on, you can say current reward plus value at the next time. That could be what you're using as your Q estimate. Or you could use value at the next, next time. Or reward, 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 value at the next, next, next time, and so forth. A3C. Um, is a policy gradient method that follows the things I've described, minus the trust region. Um, but then uses, instead of sum of rewards, uses some estimate with some value there, maybe five steps ahead, and then the value function of 10 steps ahead, then the value function, instead of just the sum of rewards. You can also weight all those estimates, and if you take an exponentially weighted average, it turns out that the way you calculate things, if you do it cleverly, it's pretty much as efficient as using just one of them. Um, very related to uh, TD Lambda, and that's what generalized advantage estimation uses. And then you have a, instead of choosing a horizon at which you cap it off, you choose a Lambda which effectively says, in a weighted way, how far are you willing to look ahead in your rollouts. And so that's essentially using eligibility traces, which I imagine Rich might talk about this afternoon. So what do we have then? We now have an actor critic algorithm. We're going to learn both a policy and a value function. We're going to collect rollouts and estimates of the value from each state action 
The simplest estimate here is just sum of rewards experienced, but more complicated estimates will be the A3C estimate of sum of rewards followed by value function, or the generalized advantage estimate, which is the exponentially weighted combination of rewards and value functions at all times. Once you've collected those, you can do an update to the value function by saying, well, the value at that state should br be brought closer to what this quantity is, and of course, some regularization. And we can get a policy gradient update on the policy um, based on the advantage estimate over here, whatever you estimate it as sum of rewards, which might be using value functions in here, minus the value of the state that you were in, times grad log probability action given state. So pretty easy to implement. And that's going to be a very effective policy gradient method. There are many variations you can have here. Um, you can imagine that for the targets here, that instead of using um, k-step look ahead, you only use one-step look ahead, which would be TD0. Imagine you can use full rollouts. There's a lot of tweaking you can do, different choices of lambda and gamma that you can use over there. And then you actually don't have to use the same over here as you use over here. In principle, they could be different. Um, in fact, often you might do something where here, when you're initially debugging, you still just use a sum of rewards, because the sum of rewards is unbiased. And once you introduce value functions, it becomes biased. So often, initially, you'll use sum of rewards over here, and still something with a value function, a TD style uh, estimate over here. And then once things are working well, maybe you start using value functions in this estimate over here, too. Okay. A3C, async advantage actor critic. Actually, this is on um, a bunch of Atari games. What you see here is that A3C outperforms uh, Q-learning methods, DQN style methods. Um, this is a paper from, I believe, about a year ago, uh, experiments from a year and a half ago, um, that shows that A3C outperforms DQN methods in terms of training time. Um, A3C was also applied then uh, actually to a pretty complicated task. What you see here is a learn policy that learn to map from first person vision to actions and how to navigate a maze to find the things that are high reward like apples and uh, cherries and so forth. So this is to learn a vision system, 3D vision system effectively and uh, actions all in one big neural net and what's possible with this approach. We can also study the effect of the choices of lambda and gamma. Um, it turns out that for lambda or here and then gamma here, it's good to choose something that's not all the way at the, at the extremes. So lambda 0.96, gamma 0.98 seems to be best here. What that means is that there's a little bit of a trade-off between how far you want to look ahead. Gamma 0.98 means that you're effectively looking ahead about 50 to 100 time steps and that that's in these environments a good look ahead while reducing variance by not looking too far ahead. Lambda is determining how much you're weighting the, um, the pure reward-based estimate versus the value function contribution when you top things off with value functions. Um, and it shows that you actually want to mostly rely on the pure reward-based estimate, which is the unbiased estimate, but bring in a little bit of the value function to reduce variance. With this, you're able to learn things like this. What we're seeing here is a humanoid robot in 3D now, learning to control itself. Um, the reward function here is just the further north, the better. The less impact with the ground, the better. And this is a neural net with about 100,000 parameters going from mapping from the joint angles, joint velocities, and center of mass coordinates and velocity to torques at each of the motors. So it's a completely from raw sensory inputs in this case at the, at the joints to uh, raw, sen raw controls at each of the motors. And the beauty, of course, with reinforcement learning is that it's not specific to the environment in which you deploy it. Um, traditionally, if you want a humanoid to walk, maybe you would have spent a lot of time thinking about humanoids and how you should control them. But with this kind of approach, you just deploy the RL algorithm on the robot of choice. You'd switch your robot of choice, and you can run the exact same code um, this is in, also in a Majoka environment that is uh, a simulator built by Emma Todorov at the University of Washington. And this robot is now learning to control itself with the same objective, same algorithm, and can learn to control itself to run actually quite fast. You can also put in different tasks. It doesn't need to be uh, running. Here the reward function is about how close the head is to standing head height. 
sitting is better than standing, um, but it's even better to stand. And what you see here is it invents standing up. There's nothing in there that has told it about what you need to do to stand up. It's just measuring distance to standing head height as the reward function, and it learns against that. OK, so what do we have left? What we've seen here is actually different ways of computing derivatives. If we pop one level up, we've seen it all in the context of reinforcement learning. But actually, this is applicable whether it's reinforcement learning or any other setting in which you need derivatives. And so in the slides, what I have here is a few examples of how you can compute gradients for stochastic neural nets using the same methodology we just covered. So it turns out that in this notation, a square node is a deterministic node, a circular node is a stochastic node, and that you can compute gradients through the stochastic neural nets by using the likelihood ratio trick the same way we computed it for policy gradients. But what's really beautiful here and what makes it so interesting is that you don't have to do the work by hand. What you can do is once you have your stochastic computation graph, you can actually define a loss function. So instead of saying, oh, it has a stochastic node that's being sampled, I need to do this grad log trick, you can actually define a loss function on that graph. Whenever there's a stochastic node, you hang off a loss function as the log probability of that stochastic node times what comes after the node. Once you do that, you can plug this into TensorFlow. And TensorFlow can compute these likelihood ratio gradients for you with backpropagation, just like you could do with a deterministic network. So you can automatically get these gradients for stochastic neural nets by just computing the computation graph corresponding to this, which means hanging log loss functions, log probabilities times what comes after off of these graphs. Some food for thought. Um, we've seen very different ways of computing derivatives, including in this general setting here. Even when you have a stochastic node that's being sampled, sometimes you can reparameterize and bring it out, bring out the noise. And you might have a question, what is the more effective way to compute derivatives? It's not always obvious um, what the best way is to do it. And I think there's a lot of thought that can still go into how to compute derivatives when you have different ways of computing derivatives. There's empirical things you could do. You can compute them both ways, look at the variance, see which one has lower variance empirically, maybe go with that, but there might be other things you can do. I think we're out of time. So what I'm going to do is flash by you the five remaining slides that you can look at when the slides are put online. I made a set of slides that show you current frontiers, directions where you might want to do research in deep reinforcement learning, as well as pointers to recent papers that um, relate to this. There's one slide. Here's another slide of current directions that I think are quite important. So a lot of opportunity to do research in this field and a lot of starting points. In terms of coding um, or more materials, there are a few classes that you can check out. Um, also be linked in the slides. Um, there is code bases that you can uh, refer to to get started. And there's a lot of domains, which can often be the bottleneck if you don't have any domains to test in that you might want to try out to work with. Thank you. <laughs>